Hello dear students. In the last uh, few lectures, we have seen the definition of a subgroup and we also saw that since the associative property is inherited, we don't need to verify this separately for a subset and uh, therefore we came up with the first necessary and sufficient condition for a subset to become a subgroup and that condition tells us that other than the associative property, we need to verify the remaining three properties. And then we came up with theorem 2 in which we need to check whether E lies inside H and whenever A and B belong to H, we need to ensure that AB inverse belongs to H. So this was the second necessary and sufficient condition that we have obtained. And uh, we can either use theorem 1 or theorem 2 to prove that a subset becomes a subgroup. So today let's start with this example. So in this example, G is given to be a group and S is given to be any subset of G. Uh, I'll have to of course assume that S is non-empty. So S is any non-empty subset of a group G. Uh, please uh, check, I mean please make sure that uh, you understand the difference between subset and a subgroup. So out here we are not saying that S should be a subgroup. We are only saying that S should be a subset of a group. And then based on this subset, we have defined a new set H suffix S to be all elements of G. So this set contains those elements of G which satisfy this condition and this condition needs to be satisfied for all elements of the set S. If you look at this condition, this is nothing but the commutative property for these two elements. So essentially in this set, we have those elements of the group which commute with all elements of the subset S. And we have to prove that this will become a subgroup of G. I'll come to part B a little later. So let us first prove that this is a, subset, a subgroup of G. And uh, in order to do this, once again, I will use theorem 1. You can try theorem 2 uh, and see why it is not so convenient to use. So let us firstly prove that this set is a subgroup of G. So remember the very first thing that you should do always whenever you are checking that something is a subgroup is to make sure that the most important element belongs to this set. And the most important element, I mean if this were to be a, this is going to be a subgroup, that means it firstly has to be a group. And uh, for a group, the most important element is identity. So we need to make sure that identity belongs to this set. So firstly, identity is definitely an element of G. And we know that E into S is S and S into E is also equal to S no matter what this S is. So this element is going to be the same as this and this will be true for all s in fact therefore it will be true for all elements in the set s so identity is one element which commutes with all elements of the set s and therefore identity belongs to this set so we have made sure that the most important element belongs to this set in the same time, we have also proved that this set is non-empty. Now, let us prove the closure property. So, let us take two elements in the set. This will mean that X commutes with all elements of the subset S. Y is also in this set. So, Y will also commute with all elements of the set S. Now, I wish to prove the closure property. So, if I take two elements in this set, I need to prove that their product 
is also in the same set. Now the product will lie in this set provided that product also commutes with every element of S. So let me take an arbitrary element of S and find out what happens to this product xy into s. Now because this is all happening in a group where the operation is associative, I am allowed to shift brackets and I can write this as x into ys. So firstly by associative property I shift brackets. Then I know that y into s is the same as s into y so long as the element s lies inside s and it does lie inside s. So y and s commute so I can write this as s into y. So y into s is the same as s into y and now once again let me use the associative property to shift brackets. So I simply shift the brackets to the first two elements and now I get xs into y. But if you look at x into s, x also commutes with all elements of s. So x into s is the same as s into x. So that's what I can write here. And one last time, let's use the associative property again. So that this is what we get. So we have proved that this element, you can think of this as z if you want temporarily. So z into s is equal to s into z and this is true no matter which element I choose from s. That means this element commutes with all elements of capital S. So I can say that this element also lies in hs. So closure property is satisfied. If two elements belong to this set, their product is also inside this set. Now let's come to the third property. The third property is the inverse. So we will start with an element in the given set and we will prove that the inverse of this element also lies inside this set. But for the moment let's see what happens if this element lies inside this set. If this element lies inside this set it has to commute with all elements of capital S. So x into s will be s into x for all s in capital S. So this element will commute with all elements of s. Now let us, uh, this is a, x is in a group so x inverse lies inside g. Let me pre-multiply and post-multiply by x inverse. And uh, because I know that the operation is associative, I'm not being too particular about putting the brackets. So if you really want to be very uh, particular about it, you can uh, include a few more steps in between and then come up with this. So here, I can decide which two I wish to combine first. So x inverse into x is e. So I get e, s, x inverse. And here again, x into x inverse is e. So this may take us a little longer but uh, as compared to theorem 2 but it's not, uh, I mean it's straightforward. And now identity times any element is that element. So E into S will be S. S into E will be S. So X, uh, X inverse also commutes with all elements of the set S and therefore I can conclude that x inverse also belongs to the set hs. So if an element lies in this set, its inverse is also inside this set and therefore I can conclude that this set is a subgroup of the group G. So for any subset S, this set that we have defined actually becomes a subgroup. So even if S itself is not a subgroup, this set hs that we have defined will always be a subgroup. Now let's come to part B. Part B says, if you look at this particular, uh, if you take, remember S is any subset. So in particular, if I take S equal to G, then also, a G will be 
a subgroup of G. In fact, a G will now look like those elements of G which commute with all elements of the group. So, in particular, when I take my subset S to be the whole group, then this is the set that I am going to get. I have already proved that this is a subgroup. This subgroup is called as the center of the group. So, the definition is also given as part of the problem. Most books use this notation for the center of a group. We will talk more about this after this example. But this is the standard notation that is used for center of a group. What we have to prove is that the center of the group has to be abelian. We have already proved that it is a subgroup. That means it is a group on its own. So I don't need to prove that it is a group again. I only wish to prove that it is an abelian group. That means I need to prove that the commutative property is satisfied for this set. So, well, that is easy to prove. Let us take any two elements in this set. We will prove that they commute with each other. So, we will prove that x into y is the same as y into x. But let us first just use the fact that x lies in this set. Well, if x lies in this set, then x is going to commute with all elements of the group. If x is going to commute with all elements of the group and y happens to be one of the elements of the group, then surely we can conclude that x will also commute with y. And therefore, we get our conclusion x into y is equal to y into x. And hence, this subgroup, which is now, which is a group on its own, is actually an abelian group. So again, another point worth noting is, Original group may or may not be abelian, but the center of the group, the center of the group is always going to be abelian. In fact, there is a result which one can prove very easily that for any group G, The center will be the whole group if and only if. In fact, I'll give you a moment to pause your video and think about it. When will the center become the whole group? In general, center is going to be a subset of G. But question is, when does it become the whole of G? So pause your video, give it a thought and then come back to the video. So center will be equal to G if and only if G is abelian. Well, the result is easy to prove in one direction. Suppose, uh, let's take this as part one of the proof. Let us assume that the center is equal to G. By center, I mean the set HG which we have defined in the earlier uh, problem. So, suppose the center is equal to the whole group. Then remember in the earlier problem, we have proved that the center is always an abelian group. So, this group is always abelian. And therefore, if this group is equal to this, automatically, this will also be abelian. So, as I said, one way the result is easy to prove. If the center is the whole group, then the group is abelian. On the other hand, Suppose G is abelian, then I need to prove that the center is equal to the whole group. And uh, this is intuitively obvious because if the group is abelian, every element is going to commute with all the other elements of the group and therefore all elements will lie in the center. So it is clear that center will be the whole group. But if you wish to prove it rigorously, then there is a very standard technique that we use in algebra. When we want to prove that two sets are equal, the best thing to do is to prove that each one 
is a subset of the other. Now it's fairly obvious that this is a subset of this because everything is happening inside our group. So it is clear that ZG is going to be a subset of G. So it's clear that ZG is a subset of G. What we need to prove is that G also is going to be a subset of ZG. So let us take any element X in G. But now our assumption is that the group is abelian. If the group is abelian, then X is going to commute with all other elements of the group and therefore X will lie in the center. And hence every element of the group lies inside the center. So G is a subset of ZG. So from 1 and 2 it will follow that G is equal to ZG. So the center will become the whole group if and only if G is abelian. In the next lecture, I'll make a few more comments about the center and then we'll look at yet another example of a subgroup. That will be all for now. Thank you.